Welcome to everyone online. Before I start today, I would first like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land. Before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on which we work today, but also on the various lands on which you all reside and work today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and thank them for protecting country since time immemorial. Welcome to all investors and advisors who have joined us today online and those that are continuing to dial in um, as I speak. You've made the time to join us today for part two of our webinar series on Australian ethical investor advocacy and industry and company engagement. There is no doubt there is a rising consciousness amongst investors. It is no longer a case of financial returns at any cost. While investors absolutely want financial security, the impact of their investment decisions on people, planet and animals is a key consideration and goes to the heart of our very business here at Australian Ethical. And today we are pleased to bring you insights from our more than 35 year track record in navigating critical social and complex ethical issues. I'm Leah Willis and glad to, glad to join you today. I'm Head of Client Relationships at Australian Ethical and your host for today's webinar. At this point, I must also provide you with general advice warning. Today's presentation contains information about some of the companies we invest in through our managed funds and superannuation options. Please, know that, please note that the information contained in this presentation is general information only and doesn't take into account your individual objectives, financial situation or needs. Before acting on anything presented in this webinar, I would encourage you to seek independent financial advice and you should refer to our FSG, PDF and all the additional information booklets available on our website at australianethical.com.au. Finally, some housekeeping for today's webinar. For everyone online, I'm sure you're going to have many questions that you want to ask of the team today. Please send them through during the webinar using the Q&A button on your screens. We will endeavour to answer as many as possible, either in response or at the end of the webinar through Q&A, um, and endeavour to answer as many as possible before today, but we will answer in time. We would love to hear your feedback on our webinar. Keep an eye out on your inbox in the next 24 hours. We will actually send you a recording of the webinar and a short survey for you to complete to let us know what you thought, but also help us improve. And finally, for the financial advisors that are online, we have applied for CPD accreditation and details on how to claim this will be included in the email after the webinar. With that, I'd like to introduce the real experts online today um, that I'm joined by. Our presenters for today will be leading you through our recent ethical lit stewardship and company engagement activities and some key areas of focus for us. Dr. Stuart Palmer, Head of Ethics. Stuart evaluates the impacts of companies, products, services and operations that they have on people, animals and the environment. He also contributes to our voice for more sustainable business and investment models and practices. Stuart has more than 30 years in financial and services and investments and nine years at Australian Ethical and has previously worked with St James Ethics Centre and as a banker and lawyer. Amanda Richman, Head of Ethical Stewardship. Amanda joined Australian Ethical Investments in February 2018. Prior to joining Australian Ethical, she was a senior associate at law firm Allens, specialising in competition law. Amanda is an experienced animal law advocate, director of the Animal Law Institute, former chair of the New South Wales Young Lawyers Animal Law Committee, and has received first class honours in law and the Dean's Awards for outstanding contributions to Macquarie Law Community and for outstanding academic achievement in law. As you can see from those, you're in very good hands today as we lead into the webinar. But first, I just wanted to quickly touch on an introduction to give some context to what it is that we do, why we're sitting here talking about responsible or ethical investing. Like many growing trends, when there is demand, there is more product proliferation. And with that, we have seen more terms, labels, and even greenwashing being applied to ESG, sustainable and ethical options. RIA, the Responsible Investing Association of Australia, summarises the different approaches to responsible investing to help simplify it for investors. And this is a spectrum of what we call shades of green, from light green to deep green, from ESG to impact investing. And I quickly wanted to just describe those labels to provide the context and background for today. ESG involves the integration, integration of ESG factors, being environmental, social and governance, 
alongside more traditional financial um, considerations. For us, it's more about risk mitigation. Exclusions go one step further and are about avoiding controversial sectors, with the main ones being tobacco, gambling and armaments. And demand from you investors means managers are being forced to consider more and much deeper exclusions. Sustainability themed funds are more thematic focused on new sustainable sectors such as clean energy, new technology and sustainable agriculture. Impact investing aims to solve critical social issues and targets disadvantaged parts of the community, such as affordable housing. This has been the domain of microfinance, however, is growing rapidly as more investors want to have a greater impact with their money and, and continue to seek out these investments. Mm -hmm. Ethical in some way covers all of these dimensions of responsible investing, as you will see in the update from Stuart and Amanda, and how broad and deep we consider our investments here at Australian Ethical. Ultimately, the most important thing is responsible investing is about ensuring capital is being applied to those investments that are delivering a better future for people, planet and animals. Further to that, I wanted to provide some background. Responsible investment assets, according to RIA, are now around 40% of totally professionally managed assets in Australia. And the number of managers engaged in RI has grown to almost 200 in the Australian marketplace. In its latest survey, RIA went one step further to define what responsible leaders looked like, those managers that are engaged in responsible investing but are pro providing greater transparency, are intentionally targeting sustainability outcomes and are supporting social and environmental shareholder resolutions. RIA identified, as you can see on this slide, active ownership and stewardship as being a key area where leaders were excelling, but also where many responsible investment managers weren't up to scratch and could do better to ensure that they're more accountable to the investors that are entrusting them with their capital allocations. You can see only 31% of managers are reporting on both activities and outcomes today, and 27% are still not reporting on those at all. Australian Ethical has been recognised as one of those RIA responsible investing leaders, and we're proud to have been at the forefront of responsible investing and impact reporting advocacy and engagement activity for more than 35 years. Today, you will hear from Stuart, Dr. Stuart Palmer and Amanda Richmond on how we approach our ethical assessment, engagement and advocacy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leah. Um, with that helicopter view of, of responsible investment from Leah, I'm going to introduce our responsible investment approach, our ethical investment approach, by talking about the way we deal with some of the specific issues, industry sectors like climate change, human rights and social media. But I am, I'm going to start with a, a snapshot of our ethical investment process. Some of this is going to be uh, familiar uh, to those uh, who were at the previous website uh, uh, webinar. I'll, I'll move through it, um, it quickly. Uh, there are two distinct parts of our, our process, which are very distinctive of, of the way we, we manage funds uh, ethically. There's the ethical screening research approach, which defines our sustainable ethical investment universe. So that's the work that the ethics research team, which Stuart and um, Stuart, which I and Amanda uh, are, are part of. Um, uh, and basically we're assessing every investment companies fixed income issuers, governments against our, our ethical ethical charter uh, to determine whether they enter or are excluded from that ethical universe. The second key component obviously of our process is that much more traditional implementation of the investment strategy undertaken by the investment team uh, working within that, that, that constrained ethical universe. So down the bottom right of that slide, there's a bit of an indication of what's, what's in and what's out. Uh, in the energy sector, for example, we're going to focus our capital towards the scaling up of renewables, other clean energy solutions. We're going to stay away from the, the fossil fuel sector. Uh, it's not all about, though, you know, what's in and, and what's not in the investment universe. Certainly targeting capital is an important part of the way that we aim to have an impact. But there are two other really important pillars of responsible investment. So up the the top right, we've got those three pillars, the, the capital, getting the capital to the right places I've talked about. Secondly, engagement and advocacy, which, which Amanda's gonna be talking in more detail 
about how we as investors try to influence the companies we invest in. And indeed, those we don't invest in also have an active public voice to influence uh, better government policy for issues like environmental protection, for uh, action to, to limit climate change. And the third pillar is, is measurement and reporting of the impact of what we do. How uh, are, are we and how are the companies we're investing in having a positive impact and, and indeed what, what's their negative footprint, which um, we should be paying attention to as well. Crucially important for the overwhelming number of our customers who come to us absolutely for uh, strong financial returns, but are also looking um, for that, that, that positive, uh, positive impact. Um, the Australian Ethical Charter is the starting point for how we make those decisions about allocating capital, uh, what the, the issues and, and, and uh, we'll engage on with, with companies and, and government. Set of 23 uh, principles, um, I'll let you look at them, they're on the, on the website, but directing us, guiding us to make investments that we assessed will promote human happiness, human education, that will support sustainable food production and, and also guiding us to stay away from investments which are going to unnecessarily harm the environment or infringe human rights, for example. Basically, 23 principles which are guiding us to invest for a better future for people, animals and the environment. Now, that, those principles haven't changed over the 30 plus year life of Australian ethical. It's a principles based framework. framework. We apply it and evolve the application of it through our industry frameworks and issue frameworks, policies, criteria, which address how we're going to deal with investment in the energy sector, in the healthcare sector, food sector, real estate sector, uh, how we're going to deal with um, issues like human rights, which, which cut across sectors, obviously, animal welfare uh, issues cutting across many, many sectors. And those individual frameworks, they do, they have evolved over the past 30 years. You know, how we've looked at energy, uh, how we've, we've looked at the food sector, how we've looked at the financial services and banking sector following the Banking Royal Commission. So they are evidence-based evolving uh, frameworks, policies, criteria, uh, drawing on, on the best uh, knowledge we have of the world and taking into account new technologies, new challenges uh, that, we're, that we're facing. Okay, let me get into the three specific issues I'm gonna be addressing. Climate change, the probably the, the gorilla in responsible investment, an understatement to say that climate change is bringing many new investment challenges and investment opportunities, growing greenhouse gas emissions from human activity has seen temperature rise already by over one degree above pre-industrial levels. Uh, it's been um, up to one and a half degrees in parts of the world like Australia. Uh, we're also seeing coming with that uh, increases in the frequency and severity of uh, rain, heat, we know rain and on the Eastern seaboard um, this summer, winter, storm and fire events, and, and these, these events will, will increase in frequency and severity as warming continues to increase. It is inevitable that the planet will continue to warm, but we can stop and even reverse warming if we dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this graph shows the scale of, of the challenge of reducing emissions. Current policies and action then is showing us getting to two and a half degrees of warming, uh, which is a scary number, and, and beyond two and a half degrees. Uh, even the most optimistic reading of the outcome of current pledges and targets by governments only limits warming to 1.8 1, 1 degrees, about twice the, the global average. And the green line shows the emissions reduction we need to be aiming for to limit warming to, to 1.5 degrees. Uh, so we need more ambition. Well, oh, too fast. We need government companies to act more urgently to limit the extent of warming. Uh, to decarbonize our economy more, more rapidly. One cause for optimism is that even without sort of strong climate policy and action, we have already seen massive low carbon innovation and investment, which has dramatically reduced the costs of technologies like uh, PV, solar, wind power and batteries. Uh, and, and as a result, increased the, the, the take up of those low emissions technologies. So at the top there, we can see their costs coming down and their take up going up, partly because of the emissions reduction characteristics of the investments, but, but partly because these are simp simply safer and, and cleaner technologies than the, uh, than the alternatives. Um, the take up 
of those technologies is going to continue. The International Energy Agency, the IEA, reported last year on what it will take to get us to net zero by 2050. That's what we need to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Uh, they say clean energy investment under that scenario needs to rise from a current level of about US one trillion per annum to four trillion per annum over the current uh, decade. And it's, it's not just energy. Um, energy is at the center of a lot of climate discussion and debate in this country, but we're going to see transition and transformation really across the economy. The latest IPCC 2022 report intergovernmental panel on climate change hundreds of scientists distilling the results of thousands of scientific papers to give us you know, the most up-to-date picture of what's going on with climate change and how we can respond to it, how we need to respond to it. They've identified over 40 categories of decarbonisation opportunity, not just energy, but also in agriculture, forestry, buildings, transport, efficiency technology, uh, technologies which lower demand for energy and materials. So of course, things like more production of electric vehicles, but also ships powered by ammonia and hydrogen, zero emission steel produced using hydrogen from renew renewables, uh, concrete in our buildings and infrastructure, which absorbs carbon, uh, uh, machines which directly capture CO2 from the air. Uh, and supporting all these changes, there's, there were gonna be fundamental changes in minerals demand. The IEA 2050 scenario sees annual demand for decarbonisation minerals, they call them, like lithium, graphite, copper, and nickel, increasing by five times over the period out to, to 2050. So these are the minerals which are gonna be essential to re-engineering industrial processes and transport to allow electricity to replace some of the other hard to decarbonise sources of energy. Now, one, um, one much discussed climate technology is hydrogen. I'll say a little bit about that. Seen a you know steady flow of announcement locally, globally about hydrogen-related uh, projects. That's only increased with the current disruption of gas markets, as uh, countries look for different ways to achieve energy security, which can be provided by hydrogen produced locally using renewable energy. Um, uh, but that that rosy outlook for for hydrogen uh, is not to say that. Um, the particular path it will take is, is clear. This slide shows some very different growth scenarios for, for hydrogen. So we expect it to play a significant role in Australian and global decarbonisation, but the size of that role is going to depend on the different ways we end up using hydrogen fuel. So those, those stronger hydrogen demand scenarios are going to play out where hydrogen is adopted widely in transport, in steel making, and for industrial and home, home heating. But there'll be relatively lower demand scenarios if we do a better job of electrifying industry and transport. So we're able to eat, make more of our energy needs from clean electricity. We don't end up needing uh, hydrogen for things like heating and transport. Um, this uncertainty of hydrogen demand is compounded by competition between different ways of producing hydrogen. We expect that green hydrogen produced by using electrolyzers powered by renewables is gonna be not only cleaner, but also cheaper than brown and blue hydrogen uh, made from fossil fuels, but that is gonna require a big scale up in renewables and electrolyzers. So, uh, you know, to finish up um, on that climate investment opportunity, you know, we think the direction of travel is clear. We will de decarbonize our economy, but the particular pathway uh, we will follow to get to net zero is uncertain. We'll see strong competition between different decarbonization technologies. They're gonna compete on cost and how much carbon they eliminate from, from the atmosphere, but they'll also compete in the role they can play in dealing with um, social and environmental challenges beyond climate. For example, you know, how are they supporting or how are they, uh, they not supporting? How are they obstructing more e equitable societies, um, protection of biodiversity? So all means that to achieve the best climate and investment outcomes, we're gonna need um, both rigorous financial analysis, but also rigorous climate impact analysis um, if, we, if we're gonna make sense of this wave of decarbonisation investment opportunities which are coming our way. Uh, let me jump to human rights. Um, human rights, important issue, has always been a focus uh, area in responsible investment. That focus has increased over the last few years. We've had modern slavery legislation in Australia uh, and around the world. Uh, we've had growing numbers of uh, Uyghur people being detained in Xinjiang and other parts of China 
the so-called re-education, uh, use in, in forced as forced labour, and most recently, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought into focus uh, that regime's, the, the Russian regime's abuse of human rights, not only now in Ukraine, but also in Russia itself. So uh, big issue for responsible investors, how best we can help protect human rights is not always straightforward. The Australian ethical, ethicals approach is different depending on whether we're looking at investment in government securities or corporate investments. For government bonds, we're not going to invest in bonds or other securities issued by undemocratic countries. So we're not buying Russian or Chinese government bonds. Uh, when we're looking at whether a country is democratic, we're assessing the quality of its democracy. We're taking into account factors like political and civil rights, like voting rights, freedom of speech, rights, rights to protest. Uh, we're looking at the quality of public institutions, levels of corruption, a range of other, other factors. And even if a government, you know, we've, we've qualified them as democratic, we may still exclude them if we assess it to be uh, militaristic. Now, that doesn't mean we exclude countries um, simply for maintaining military forces for defensive purposes, but we, we will exclude countries where military power is being used unjustly to invade or threaten other countries. Now, sometimes what isn't, isn't uh, uh, unjust uh, uh, aggression uh, is a complex area, uh, but, but that's, that's the principle. Now, that, that's the government side of, of, of our investment. Although we don't invest in, in government bonds of undemocratic or militaristic countries like Russia, China, Myanmar, um, that doesn't automatically mean we exclude investment in companies which operate inside those countries or who have supply, ch supply chains in those countries. Um, uh, the human rights criteria in our human rights framework focus on the steps that companies are taking to protect against being involved in human rights breaches. So for high risk companies uh, operating, depending, it's determined on the basis of where they operate, the sorts of products and manufacturing, electronics, cotton, for example, high risk sectors, um, we're gonna be looking at the human rights policies and procedures they have, and also the reporting of how they are implementing those policies and procedures. And um, this past financial year, uh, we've excluded um, a few companies on human rights grounds. Uh, Xinjiang Goldwind Science and Technology Co. is a renewable energy company. We, we, like, we like it for that. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, we, we did identify concerning connections between the company and Uyghur forced labour programs, also in the leadership of the, the company with the, the, the Communist Party. Uh, and there was, at the end of the day, insufficient detail in the company's reporting on those issues, how they were protecting against being implicated in human rights breaches. So we, we divested from, from our investment there. Um, we don't automatically exclude when we, when we identify human rights concerns. In some cases, it's just not clear uh, how companies should respond uh, to some human rights breaches and crises. So um, a couple of examples in the middle column there, telecommunications company Telenor, they exited Myanmar, after the military uh, took back power there. But the company has been criticized for that by human rights advocates uh, who say that it simply ended up with the military acquiring additional influence over the telco assets they, they left behind. A couple of examples from Russia there, different responses, global plumbing company Gaberit did suspend its operations in Russia, building materials company Rockwell, uh, they continued operating uh, their view was if they stopped operating, their business would likely be nationalized. So it would result in, in the regime uh, acquiring control of those assets. So three different sorts of responses, raising different issues, we've stayed invested in, in those three companies. Lastly, and too quickly really for the, the size of the issue, uh, social media, it's a difficult area for us to navigate. It's complex to judge different social media platforms and, and I guess the, the sector, if I can call on that generally, social media, those sort of information sharing platforms, digital information sharing platforms are so pervasive, uh, so much a part of the way we live our lives. You know, this can make it difficult to overlook their benefits and, and focus just on the cases where they're, they're being used and implicated in, in harmful activity. We do see wide ranging benefits from social media and other digital information sharing platforms. So social media can be used to mislead, absolutely, but can also be used to reveal the truth, to expose misconduct of powerful people, companies, governments, and to hold them to account for, for their wrongdoing. Uh, they also 
we sometimes forget, give us unprecedented, unprecedented access to diverse information. Um, for someone my age thinking about how, yeah, 10 years ago and more, um, yeah, information access was, uh, was just um, um, completely different um, to, to what we enjoy now. Um, these platforms can also help people stay connected when they're isolated as a result of, of pandemic or other reasons. Um, benefits then, but obviously also uh, a lot of misuse of these platforms. They are used to spread disinformation. They can make people feel more isolated rather than more connected. Currently, where are we? We, we think there is a positive role for so, social media in our society and economy if these platforms are properly regulated and if they are uh, responsibly operated. Um, that's a, a, big, a big if. Um, in the coming year, we're planning to focus on two areas. So the steps social media companies, but also governments and parents can take to better protect young users, particularly teenage girls who are identified by the researchers as, as, um, as a demographic, which, which um, uh, disproportionately uh, experience harm from, from social media use during those teen years. Uh, the second area of focus, what role uh, can Australian Ethical play to support better social media regulation? You know, positively, we are seeing increased regulation of social media around the world, but it is still very fragmented. The UK, we have uh, recently introduced a, a children's code which imposes standards to protect children's data online. And in Australia, we have a new co collaboration between four regulators now looking at, at social media regulation. So that's the ACCC, ACMA, the E Safety Commissioner, the Australian Information Commissioner, and they have announced their strategic priorities for the current financial year, greater scrutiny of the impact of algorithms which they're, they're using, the platforms, social media platforms are using, and secondly, increased transparency of how social media companies are protecting users from potential harm. Um, I'm gonna leave it there, pass over to Amanda. Thanks, Stuart, and hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to cover some examples about advocacy and engagement over FY22 and also discuss our approach and our reporting. And it would be great to get your feedback on what we're doing, whether you think there's gaps or things that we could be doing better. So please share your thoughts with us in the Q&A box. We'd really welcome that feedback. Um, first, some context. What do we mean by engagement and advocacy and why do we do it? So we need systemic change across multiple industries to tackle the most difficult and important challenges of our time. Yeah, Stuart talked about climate change. There's also nature loss. We talked about human rights abuse and there's of course industrialized animal cruelty. And I was very pleased to see a question about that in the chat before. As an ethical investor, of course, we use capital allocation to help drive change by investing in companies that we think on balance benefit people, animals and the planet and avoid those that cause unnecessary harm. But while ethical driven capital allocation is critical, we know that on its own, our ethical screen is not going to be enough to achieve the economic and social transformation we need to get to a future where people, animals and the planet prosper. And there are a few reasons for this. Um, first, obviously the fact that we do not invest in or allocate capital to harmful industries doesn't mean they don't continue to exist. So you know, we don't invest in fossil fuel companies, but they're still chugging away. We're still seeing new oil and gas projects in Australia. The second reason is that we do not invest in exclusively perfect companies. The economy is so far from perfect, inevitably in any portfolio, there will be companies you need to engage with. So in addition to capital allocation, we see engagement and advocacy with companies both inside and outside the portfolio and with government and with the responsible investment community as another tool we can use to have real world influence. Because we are seeking to address systemic issues, we do not limit our stewardship to ensuring that investee companies financial returns are acceptable. That is obviously very important and something that the investment team does, but on its own, that will not address and it can even exacerbate systemic challenges. And this is recognised in the UNPRI's guidance for investors on active ownership. It notes that a company can seek to strengthen its position by externalising costs onto others. And while that might be good for their financial performance, it's bad for humanity, it's bad for the planet, it's bad for the other sentient beings that we share it with. 
And from a financial point of view, it can be bad for our portfolio because these systemic risks challenge the social and environmental foundations on which we all rely to deliver strong financial performance. So that's the context for why we do our advocacy and engagement. Let's jump to what we've um, actually done over the last financial year. So at the start of FY22, we identified key areas where we want to leverage our influence. And one of those is influencing the finance sector to cut lending to unsustainable fossil fuel expansion. Although we identify this as a focus for FY22, it is something we've been working on for close to a decade. When people think about the finance sector supporting the fossil fuel industry, they of course immediately think of the banks, but the issue is, is broader than that. So we also look at insurance companies and their investing and underwriting of the fossil fuel sector as well. Why is this an area of focus? We won't be able to achieve global emission reduction targets without large financial institutions helping to finance the transition. And we also see that our exposure to this sector means that we can in some ways influence volumes of finance or volumes of capital that are far greater than what we have under management. So engaging with these institutions really magnifies our influence. Over the last nine years, we have co-filed shareholder resolutions, agitated issues both in private discussions and publicly criticising companies at their AGMs. We have collaborated closely with organisations like Market Forces. And over that time, we have seen the financial institutions shift considerably, including making commitments to align their lending to the Paris Agreement, not lend to certain projects, cap exposure to thermal coal, and increase their lending to renewables. In FY22, our focus has really been on their oil and gas exposure. So we met with Westpac and NAB, and what we've been asking for is that they assess Paris alignment of every new major oil and gas project. These are really important conversations to be having because we don't want to see the banks weasel out of their Paris commitments by simply aligning their portfolios to the Paris Agreement while still supporting individual oil and gas projects that are fundamentally not aligned. Uh, we of course also supported shareholder resolutions calling for Paris aligned targets and to end the financing of new fossil fuel projects. And we helped fund independent research. We think independent research is an important tool to hold companies to account. And we saw a need for research that assessed the Paris alignment of planned Australian gas projects. So in FY22, we helped finance and contribute to an IGCC commissioned report, which examined high impact planned Australian gas projects and their risks for non-alignment with the Paris Agreement. Um, and we did see some progress in FY22, NAB and Westpac announced new restrictions on their lending to the oil and gas sector, and they've committed to providing further detail this year about their criteria for assessing the Paris Agreement alignment of high impact projects. And we will use the IGCC report together with existing research from the International Energy Agency and IPCC reports to assess whether the bank's targets and criteria are sufficient and if they're being genuine in their efforts to align their lending to the Paris Agreement. On to insurance companies. Again, our focus is on oil and gas. In January, we had meetings with QBE's sustainability team to understand how they are progressing their thinking on oil and gas exposure. Disappointed with their lack of ambition, we co-filed a shareholder resolution calling for them to disclose targets to reduce investment and underwriting exposure to oil and gas assets. And at their AGM, Stuart Palmer, who you just heard from, um, challenged their existing policies and pointed out that they are falling behind their competitors. Interestingly, after the AGM, QBE asked Stuart to meet with the company's new CEO, and this was the first time we've had an opportunity to discuss our concerns with the CEO of QBE. And we think this, this demonstrates that investors can publicly call out the shortcomings of investee companies without closing the door to productive private conversations. So in our view, responsible investors should not avoid challenging companies publicly just because it's uncomfortable and they should be prepared to use all tools at their disposal to influence positive change. QBE has joined the Net Zero Insurance Alliance and as part of that, it must set science-based targets. So while we consider QBE's current policy to be inadequate, we will assess them on their target, which is due to be published in mid 2023. And meanwhile, our climate patience has run out with two other insurers and we divested. And on that, 
engagement versus divestment debate, if it is still happening, um, our view, we see divestment as an important tool to complement other engagement and advocacy activities. And in, in our view, investors need to, to be doing both. So that's fossil fuels and finance. Um, next topic is animal research and why this topic? Um, an estimated 190 million animals were used for scientific purposes in 2015. And most of these animals have spent their entire lives in cages, have been bred to have painful diseases or subjected to very invasive procedures or experiments that induce high levels of stress. So we do not invest in cosmetic companies that conduct or commission animal research. However, we recognise that animal research is currently a necessary part of developing healthcare products like COVID-19 vaccines. But given sentient animals subjected to research can suffer extreme distress and pain, we expect companies that are involved in this to take seriously their obligation to avoid and reduce animal suffering. There are already global principles known as the three R's that set out basic expectations for those involved in animal research. So replace animals with alternatives wherever possible, reduce the number of animals used, refine the procedures to minimize suffering. And the three R principles have been enshrined in regulatory regimes. But in Australia, as in most jurisdictions, there is very little regulatory oversight of animal research and very limited coordinated efforts to advance the three R's, and in particular, the development, validation and commercialisation of alternatives. As an investor in the healthcare sector and one of only a few investors that are alive to this issue, we see it as our responsibility to work with companies on this. In FY18, we started engaging with 14 healthcare companies plus other stakeholders to understand how companies approach the three R's, what best practice looks like and where there are areas for improvement. And we found the standard response from companies was, well, all our animal research is approved by animal ethics committees. But our research found that animal ethics committees rarely challenge the validity of an animal research proposal they haven't stopped very questionable research on animals proceeding. They have their place, but they're also not a good vehicle to progress the use of alternatives. So we developed five minimum expectations of companies involved in animal research to demonstrate what genuine application of the three hours looks like. And one aspect of those minimum expectations was that companies cannot rely solely on animal ethics committees to assess whether an alternative to animal research could be used and they must ensure consultation with experts in alternatives. In FY22, we wrote to um, several Australian and New Zealand companies to confirm they are meeting our minimum expectations and five now do. Going forward, we are escalating engagements with the companies who failed to demonstrate they meet our expectations. And this financial year, we wrote to the CEO of one company making it clear this could be grounds for divestment. And they now plan to introduce an animal welfare policy by the end of this calendar year. The animal welfare policies only go so far and replacing animals with alternatives must be the focus. This is an area where no one company could advance this issue materially on their own. So it's right for investor involvement to encourage collaborative efforts by industry to fund, validate and, com and commercialize alternatives to animal research. And that's going to be the focus for this engagement in FY23. And finally, animal agriculture and deforestation. So the world has a livestock problem and it is one that's felt particularly in Australia. And I'm not talking about methane, I'm talking about land use. Animal agriculture uses a disproportionate amount of land and other resources relative to the nutritional value it provides. In Australia, about half of Australia's total land mass is used for agriculture. And of this land, about 86.5% is used just for grazing. Additional land is also used to grow grains for farmed animals. Using so much land for livestock is hugely inefficient. Research suggests that if we move from current diets to diets that exclude animal products, the world could reduce foods land use by 3.1 billion hectares, which is a 76% reduction. And why does land use matter? Well, I did see a question in the chat about the importance of nature-based solutions to climate change. 
And, and this is exactly it. Every hectare of land we use for extractive industries is a hectare that we cannot use for wild forests, for savannas, for wetlands, for natural grasslands and other crucial ecosystems, which provide services like sequestering carbon and um, providing habitat for native species. So the impact of livestock plays out really visibly in Australia. Australia is the only developed country in the world with an identified global deforestation hotspot, and livestock is the primary driver of that land clearing. In Queensland, 93% of deforestation and land clearing in 2018 to 2019 was for conversion to pasture. We also have one of the world, world's worst track records for mammal extinctions. Clearing of native vegetation is a major cause of habitat loss and fragmentation and has been implicated in the listing of 60% of Australia's threatened species. Estimates by WWF suggest that almost 4.9 million animals died due to land clearing every year in the decade between 2005 and 2015. And TWS research shows that in Queensland, around 80% of likely or known koala habitat cleared between 2018 and 2019 was cleared for beef production. So we're not sure that the disproportionate and unsustainable impacts of animal agriculture and particularly livestock is well understood or accepted by those who can influence and are exposed to the sector in Australia, including banks, insurance companies, food retailers, consumers and other investors. There is a general understanding, of course, that beef has a high emissions footprint and there's a lot of talk of seaweed and regenerative agriculture to fix that problem but no form of regenerative agriculture can sequester as much carbon or provide as much habitat and support as much flora and fauna as an intact native ecosystem. So we avoid investments in conventional animal agriculture because we assess the harm to animals and the disproportionate environmental impact to be unnecessary where there are less impactful alternatives. However, we still consider the impact of livestock in Australia to be an issue over which we can have a positive influence. So this slide sets out what we've done on this issue in FY22. And to make sense of it all, I suppose we think about it in terms of two work streams that inform each other. So first, we want to understand how finances of the livestock industry and the major supermarkets are thinking about this issue. And to that end, we've had initial conversations with NAB and with Woolworths. But we know that collaborative investor engagements carry far more weight. So in FY22, we tried to create forums for these collective um, investor engagements to happen. We signed up to global initiatives through which we expect to have collaborative conversations about this issue with other banks and retailers. And we established a corporate engagement subgroup of the RIA Nature Working Group. So these conversations can happen locally as well. The second work stream is to commission a report that highlights the key impacts of livestock in Australia, both from an emissions perspective, but more importantly, because it isn't as discussed from a biodiversity perspective. And on that, we have been speaking closely to several NGOs to understand what information is already out there and where the gaps are. And we have also started speaking to potential researchers. So what's next? We will continue to pursue um, collaborative conversations, which we think will help inform the content of the report. And the plan is to have the report underway in FY23, which can then also help inform the content of the continuing conversations. So those are some examples of our engagement and advocacy in FY22. Now to zoom out from the detail um, and just give an overall picture of what we've been up to. In FY22, we engaged with over 450 companies for people, animals and the planet. This number does not include engagements by the investment team that are more focused on company risk and return rather than company impacts. We also want to make clear that this number includes supporting collective engagement where all we may have done is simply signed onto a statement or letter. And we think it's important just to distinguish between that and the more proactive engagements where we've done something more meaningful either on our own or in collaboration with others. In FY22, we had over 78 proactive engagements and around 25% of those resulted in meaningful change. So that's a wrap. As I said, we would love your feedback on this, what we are doing, how we report on it, what other information you would like to see. We will include this information and more in our sustainability report and on our website as well. And we are aiming to provide um, periodic, 
periodic updates to, to show our progress throughout the year. So thank you for your time and now for the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stuart and Amanda. And I hope that was useful for everyone online. And we did get some comments back saying thank you for last week or the, the previous webinar and today's. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come through, which I have been holding off on. Um, Amanda, I might go to you straight away, if you don't mind, given that you've just presented. And, and look, I didn't, um, I was sort of busy answering questions, so I didn't actually catch this per se. But one of the participants has said the use of standard dual strategy of engagement as an investor, engagement, divestment, what is the third way to improve outcomes? I'm not quite sure I entirely understand that, but it might relate to what you were saying around engagement versus divestment and, and what we have in terms of tools to be able to influence companies. Don't know if you can add to that. Yeah, so I, 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 when I was talking about it, my main point was that we use both engagement and divestment as tools, but there's there's many other, there's there's many forms that investor engagement and advocacy can take. So it can be private discussions, it can be public criticism, it can be filing shareholder resolutions, commissioning independent research, divesting, and it's important when to divest, divesting publicly and notifying the company of your decision and, and why. Um, so I think there's there's many tools. I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as um, being a, a dual strategy, um, but perhaps I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, thanks so much, Amanda. And we might um, divert to that participant if you've got anything else you wanted to, to put to us, happy to respond to you. Um, Stuart, back to you in terms of, and these are, are hot questions that we get almost every time we present. Um, so I'm assuming you're going to be able to um, answer these Pretty succinctly, um, how is Australian Ethical assessing the ethical or sustainability um, of EVs considering the need for rare earth in minerals and other non-recyclable components, short battery life versus combustion engines, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, it is an issue for EVs, solar. Um, uh, so uh, we do need to scale up extraction of some of the key minerals. Some of them are coming from uh, areas where there are uh, huge human rights concerns, cobalt uh, out of parts of, of Africa, uh, very rare out of out of parts of China. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a bit of a balancing exercise. Um, we are investing selectively in in the mining sector in minerals like lithium, which which do need that uh, that that scale up. We will look at how individual mining companies are operating to minimise their environmental footprint, their, their impact on on local communities, particularly indigenous. Uh, communities um, and at the same time you know being uh, clear about the need for better recycling longer life circular econ economy type initiatives which over time can reduce the amount of this fresh ore that we 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 need to we need to to mine and of course you know when we're excluding investment in what we think are unsustainable parts of the economy we see huge opportunities to reduce the amount of iron ore um, cobalt, rare earths that we're using in, for example, you know, electronics, which which might be overused rather than than reused and built for longer life. Perfect, thanks, Joy. Um, and uh, one that's related to that, which is another popular one, is there's no mention of nuclear power as a source of, of providing clean energy. Um, for example, a lot of the new technology, small modular reactors that are that are now coming to market. Yeah, uh, so we'll look at new technologies which which come to to market, um, you know, particularly those which are able to address some of the significant risks which come with nuclear, um, uh, such as uh, accidents at, at, at facilities, um, how we deal with the long-lived nuclear waste, diversion of enriched uranium for weapon uh, weapons uh, purposes. Um, I mean, our current view is that the the sorts of reactors. Um, uh, that, that, that are being built are large reactors. They take 10 years to build. We have a, 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 an urgent need to decarbonize now. We have technologies, whether it's wind, solar, geothermal, battery storage, hydro storage. So it's those renewable sources that we're, we're focusing, uh, focusing on rather than, rather than nuclear. Perfect, thanks, Stuart. Um, one for, I'm not quite sure which one of you wants to grab this, but um, this question is about human rights abuses in Australia, um, especially in the Northern Territory and WA. How, how do we 
um, I guess, face into or create discussions? Do we have discussions at board staff with our own government, the Commonwealth yeah. of Australia, and how do we face into that? Yeah, and sorry, listen, let me make a, have a quick go at that um, because, yeah, I didn't want to give the impression in the examples I gave that it's all about, hey, this bad stuff happening overseas. Of course, locally, we've, we've had lots of issues. I mean, in our agricultural supply chains, um, uh, vulnerable workers um, being exploited by labour hire companies. So that's an area where we engaged extensively with Coles and, and Woolworths about the action that they needed to be taking to prevent against those abuses in, in their supply chain. On the government front, uh, going back a, a couple of years, yeah, we put in a number of submissions around the importance of modern slavery legislation. We actually presented to one of the committees, I think it was a Senate committee looking at that, that legislation before it was introduced. Uh, in sort of, a, the, the, the question is thinking about the mining sector, obviously huge issues. Um, it's, it's how mining companies are dealing with free, prior and informed consent from affected communities, particularly indigenous communities is a, is a big focus area, something we've, we've, we've engaged with companies on, even those we don't, don't invest in. We don't invest in Origin or currently in Fortescue, we're engaged with both of them about um, concerns about um, their practices in that area. And indeed the way they, we think they should be supporting legislative change. So, um, you know, Western Australian legislation, there was a big hole there, which uh, was part of the problem, uh, which led to Duke and Gorge's destruction. So we're, we're really um, in our discussions with Fortescue, for example, keen to see them supporting uh, improvement to, to those legislative protections. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, th this one, um, once again, either of you, but maybe Stuart, um, is Australian Ethical doing anything to influence the super industry overall, i.e. working with other super funds, opening up dialogue with industry and corporate funds, um, where the vast majority of fund currently sits in terms of influencing their ESG focus and investments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, so I mean, Amanda gave that, that number of, of um, you know, 450 headline number of engagements. A lot of those are collaborative. Um, so, uh, you know, we're active members of Climate Action 100 Plus, which is engaging globally with the world's biggest emitters. We've um, been a co-lead on, on the engagement with, with building company Ball, uh, you know, groups really, I think, productive, effective groups like the Investor Group on Climate Change, the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, uh, globally, the UNPRI, active members there. So we're contributing our voice and our perspective on a range of issues there. To be honest, I think probably the biggest impact we have had is through our success as a, as a business. Um, as, as funds see flows coming to us because um, some of their customers wanting to invest more like us than a traditional mainstream investing approach uh, has gathered the uh, you know, attention of the industry. And, and I think you know, not just us, obviously others have, have driven this wave of interest in, in, in ESG because of the success of these strategies, both from a values alignment point of view, but also their um, their investment, financial investment um, success. Perfect, thanks, Joy. Um, we're almost up for time, so I would encourage anyone who has final questions, please send them through. Um, but but on that note, I just wanted to pose something, I guess, that relates to that. Um, we have had some fantastic growth. We continue to see Australians wanting to have an impact uh, with their retirement savings uh, through the Super Fund, but also through other investments outside of Super. Um, there is a lot of product coming to market, as I alluded to up front, with lots of different labels, and we've seen the likes of ASIC APRA, the SEC, the EU taxonomy, um, sort of coming out with statements around uh, regulation, labelling, greenwashing. Um, any comments to help investors and advisors navigate all of those new products and labels? Sorry, that's that's to, to us, Leah. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll just go back, I guess, to my introduction, and I'm just noting there's some other, Amanda, you jump in, there's some other questions in the chat, I don't know whether you had additional commentary on them, some are relating to animal ag and, and so on. Um, uh, yeah, I go back to that, the, the beginning of, of my, my part of today around those three pillars. Um, yeah, whether it's ethical, sustainable, impact investing, um, I think asking the question uh, of an investment manager or a particular product, what is it doing around the way it's targeting capital? So what's in, what's out, why? You know, is there transparency around the sectors uh, they will and won't invest in and, and the particular investments? Uh, secondly, what work are they doing around engagement and advocacy? Uh, it's not all about targeting capital, that's part of it. 
but absolutely uh, engagement and advocacy to help shift um, high emitting, emitting companies is, is crucial, getting better policy settings. So what's happening on that front? And then thirdly, um, you know, talk about it, all the, the colour and movement um, that's happening around that. Yeah, what does the portfolios end up looking like? And comparing them to mainstream benchmarks. Um, so if you've got a sustainability option, well, what is the carbon footprint of that option compared to the benchmark? What's its, the level of its, of its investment in renewable energy, climate solutions compared to, to the benchmark? More broadly, you know, uh, there's a lot of data sets now out there and, and publicly available tools which track the revenue companies are earning uh, from products and services contributing towards the sustainable development goals. So run those tools on your portfolio, um, compare them to a mainstream benchmark. And I think, yeah, um, those just concentrating on those three, those those three pillars, um, you know, beyond the labels is is a helpful starting point. Perfect. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you so much. Um, and I know Amanda answered one of those last questions, and it looks like we're almost out in terms of um, some of the questions around the portfolio. Were there any particular um, sort of lasting comments or, that you wanted to make um, before we leave today? Amanda or Stuart, anything to add to the discussion? Amanda, you take the final word. <laughs> I don't have anything to add, but thanks for the opportunity, Stuart. Yeah, perfect. Um, with that, I'd like to, to wrap up today's webinar. Um, we really do hope that you've enjoyed uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we um, provided an update from an, from an investments perspective. Um, and today we've given you the, the ethical perspective. And I think that's a really important sort of closing comment to say that we do take both really seriously. We, we understand the fiduciary duty we have um, to provide long-term security and returns the investors that, that sort of engage us to, to manage their investments, either in super or outside of super. But equally, we're wanting to make sure that that capital is being allocated in the most appropriate way, in a responsible way that avoids unnecessary harm to people, planet and animals, and really does provide the best possible chance for a more sustainable future. Um, so with that, I will thank you for taking the time to join us today. We hope you found it valuable and we would encourage you to come back um, on the survey link uh, that will be emailed to you to provide us your feedback and any thoughts on what more you'd like to see in here. But thank you so much.